So, so we're going to have a little chat around um, how you innovate in, in AI in a large organization. And um, so I'm the CIO for O2, Telefonica UK in the UK. Um, and I'm going to let Andy and Nicola introduce themselves and then we'll get into the, the meat of the debate. So Andy. Cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Well done for staying the course. An amazing couple of days, but if you're still here at this time on the second day, then all power to it. Hopefully you'll get something out the next, uh, next 40 minutes or so. Uh, so I'm Andy Day. Um, uh, I guess a brief synopsis, a lifetime in data and analytics and, uh, and the deployment of artificial intelligence before data was cool, um, largely in the corporate world. So uh, I've worked for Sky TV, uh, O2 for 10 years. Brenda and I worked together at, uh, at O2. Uh, more recently at News UK, um, the owners of The Sun and, uh, and, and The Times. And then latterly at, uh, at Sainsbury's well as Chief Data Officer. I guess what gets me out of bed in the morning is how you can apply data analytics, data science, artificial intelligence to create customer uh, and business value. Uh, and that's the bit that excites me about this world. And I think we've talked a lot about that across the course of the last two days, and hopefully you'll get a bit, bit more of a sense of that over the course of the next 40 minutes. So for those of you who were not at the last session, where were you? Um, so uh, my name's Nicola. Uh, I did used to be BT's futurologist. Uh, I got tired of the crystal ball jokes, um, and I am now slightly more boringly known as head of customer insight and futures. I work for BT's innovation team. Um, I'm aligned to BT Global Services. So uh, I help our customers innovate, basically, by providing a speed dating service, I keep calling it, uh, between our research guys at Adastral Park, also known as Martlesham, uh, and really trying to address some real business problems with innovation and technology. Okay, thanks Andy, thanks Nicola. So, so let's start with that. We're supposed to be talking about how large organizations innovate in, in AI, but actually can large organizations innovate in AI? So a recent survey, the 218 Gartner CIO survey, said that um, less than 29% of large organizations actually do anything more than just do POCs and small tests. And in fact, 43% of large organizations don't have any plan for AI, for utilizing AI at all. So we're in a world where actually maybe large organizations are failing to innovate. And what I'm gonna ask uh, Andy and Nicola is maybe what, what the problem is and how uh, in organizations they've been in, and also uh, I can bring something from O2 about how we actually break those barriers down. So my first question, actually, 91% of CIOs blame data. So Andy, it's your problem. Um, all me, CIOs go, it's not IT, it's the data guys, it's their problem. Is that true? Or what do you see as the barriers to uh, successful innovation in AI in large organizations? I think, uh, I think there's a whole series of things, uh, a couple of things I'll pick up on. Uh, is it data? Yes, but I think actually the fundamental issue with the conversation about data is, that typically organizations start to think about data to begin with rather than the applications of the data. And actually the, the, the model needs to be shifted and you need to start with working out what the business is trying to achieve and then build the tools, the technology, the data, the skills from that. Um, so uh, in organizations that I've worked in, uh, O2 being a, a good example, you know, when I joined the business some 15, 20 years ago, there was big projects that were building huge data warehouses where teams of developers were locking themselves away with great big specifications in small dark rooms for months on end, in fact years on end, and then uh, you know, at the point where this, the, 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 the data platform had been delivered, they'd come out and wave the jazz hands and everybody go, yeah, but that doesn't do what the business needs it to do now, the time, times have moved on. So I think one of the challenges is actually starting with the business, working out what data and skills you need and developing from there, and actually that unlocks some of the challenges. And I think linked to that actually is the relationship between the chief data officer or the, the person that's leading the analytics challenge uh, and the CIO or CTO in organizations. Uh, I don't think they're the same job. Um, I don't think the CDO or the CIO should report into one another, but they should be absolutely best friends because the role of the CIO, in my opinion, is to help the CDO deliver the applications of data by standing up the platforms, providing the tools and technologies uh, that enable the data scientists, the analysts, the guys that are producing the, the, the AIs to, to be successful. Okay, okay. So Nicola, your view, what, what do you think is holding it back in, uh, in big organisations? Well, I agree with absolutely everything Andy said, so I think that's absolutely true. I think my experience from very practical um, work with chatbots within organisations like banks is um, absolutely, sometimes, so there's hype. You might have noticed there's a bit of hype around about AI at the moment, and I think um, 
Firstly, you tend to get people um, getting really carried away by the hype and getting really excited. And as, as I said in the earlier session, I get lots of customers going, I want a bot. And go, Why do you want a bot? Because everyone else is doing it. Well, OK. Um, so there's no reason. Uh, so we have to think about why, why would you have one? So start with the customer. What, what are customers wanting? And they want an easy life. So I think the, the first thing is, how do we make things quicker and easier for customers? Um, so one, one example with an airline recently, we were looking at um, using um, Alexa um, to check in and get your boarding pass, um, which is great. I mean, it's fun. It's kind of great innovation. But we then, um, half, after doing a prototype proof of concept, uh, timed how we would do that using just a voice interface versus what we would do on the app. And it took about three to four minutes using the voice interface and about 30 seconds on the app. So instantly we start to see, well, actually, sometimes it's just going to be easier using the device that we kind of have constantly on us, our window on the world. So that's that's one thing. Then what's the outcome? So hopefully it's better customer experience because if it's not better customer experience why are you doing it in the first place um, uh, but is it is it to free up your people so that they can do the more complex stuff is it to improve your net promoter score um, so again you know stepping back and saying well what are the metrics for success here um, absolutely there's messy data to contend with so um, you know we've done a couple of things with banks where we tried to put the bot in but the, the data was just so messy and it's so clumsy that we ended up just stepping back and saying you need to sort your data out um, you, you can't do this without sorting your data out and then there's a massive cost to sorting data out as well um, so there's a pre-investment before you get to the point of being able to implement this um, and then the final one uh, again from very practical experience is because this is new technology and innovation always implies risk. Um, the risk aversity of an organization is a real big problem in terms of particularly big organizations. You know, they, they resist change. They're built to resist change. And certainly that, that appetite for risk is another one that we, we, <laughs> we encounter, particularly in you know, regulated markets like banks. So if you suggest to a bank, hey, let's put a machine learning bot in, you know, it will learn from responses and, uh, you know, the, the, the black box that's behind it will, you know, all the machine learning, it was really exciting. Now, we actually did that as a proof of concept with a bank. They instantly came back and went, well, how do we know that it's saying the right thing? And how do we then audit it back? So it's that obvious, you know, that transparency piece that's been discussed in a few of the sessions around how do we audit back the, the quality control? How do we do that with machine learning? So actually, the, the bot that we ultimately, well, we didn't implement it in the end, um, it was a decision tree. There was obviously the natural language processing and recognition at the front end, which is clever in itself, but it was just following a happy path. And if it didn't follow the happy path, it kind of crashed and went, I can't help you. Um, so I think that all of those factors are problematic, particularly I mean, from the experiences that we've had with chatbots. I think there's also a, 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 an element of fear in organizations. We've talked a lot about the fact that AI uh, is going to take people's jobs um, and you see that that kind of very real kind of fear on people's face when you talk to that talk about the fact that you can help do their job better than they currently do it and I have kind of two fundamental beliefs and that is you know we've heard across the course of the last two days you can measure anything so that means you can collect data on absolutely everything um, and if you can collect data on everything and you can apply those data it means everybody everybody's job can be done or done better with the application of those data and that, for a lot of people, is, is, is very worrying. And so the resistance that organizations have, especially legacy organizations, to, you know, uh, in essence, organization, uh, somebody like me or a data scientist telling them how they could do their job better is, 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 is quite scary. Mm. It is. And, and one of the ways that um, large organizations kind of cope with that, or at least at, at O2, we run a little innovation lab. And in that, we've done some, well, quite a bit of AI experimentation around uh, self-optimizing our network or even personalization in some of our applications like O2 Priority, et cetera. So what do you think about innovation labs and innovating on the edge of your business as opposed to innovating the core? And then how do you go from that innovation to real production-ready AI capability? Um, well, yeah, I think that, that there is certainly, again, if you can start to establish an area where you know it's fun to fail, you know, failure is part of this and you don't get punished. So being within an innovation team, actually, we, as long as we learn from failure, uh, that's really not a problem. So there's a certain element of um, having effectively a sand pit. But I think we also learn, again, from experience in BT that um, when 
at Astral Park was kind of a uh, Maltlesham, which is where I'm based, um, was kind of almost separate from the organisation, and we were the weird geeky people in sandals and and knitwear, um, and you know the, the the guys in sharp suits you know, didn't really understand what we did. That was a problem because we never got the two communities to come together and actually do practical innovation, which is why. Um, we do a lot more very practical stuff, so the stuff that you can see in our stands is a mixture of very theoretical research that we're doing that we could probably, if it works, translate into you know real business, but also um, you know slightly closer term stuff that, that is, is very much real innovation. Um, the other thing we know we have to do is co-innovate, um, so again, co-working we can't do it all on our own. So, you know, running hot houses with clients on particular problems, bringing lots of experts together, working with university partners, all of those things, I think, start to, to get that sort of diversity that you need for innovation, but you also need a business champion and you also need the business case. Um, so all of those very pragmatic things that you have to have in a large organisation for, for innovation to work have to be there as well. But I think there is a case to just have a pure, let's see what this technology could do, let's see what these ideas can take to. And if it fails, it fails, but we learn. Yeah, and I think, I think there's probably two builds on that. The first is uh, big corporate organisations are not good at innovation, period. Um, <clears throat> and so innovating in the core of a business is really tough and inevitably processes, governance, those sorts of things get in the way. And, and the innovative ideas, the new things that are going to change the way a business operates or the way a business manages itself, uh, get genuine tissue rejection. And, and you see lots of organizations, GE being a good example of this, where innovation at the edge is the way they innovate now. Uh, so they take people out of the core business, uh, put them at the edge of the business to, to, to drive innovation. Uh, and then the challenge is how do you get that innovation back into the business without getting that tissue rejection? And I think to build on Nicholas' point, that in, you know, internal to a business means uh, collaborating with the business owners. I think our job is to actually help people in the organisation hit their targets. And if, you see, if you're seen as, a, as, a, as an aid to their success, then the likelihood of tissue rejection, the likelihood of not getting past the uh, not invented here is, is, is maybe a thing of the past. Okay, good. And, and I'm just interested, so, um you know, we've seen, so in my own world, we've seen some good applications of AI uh, very successfully, so sort of in personalization, uh, particularly in sort of programmatic uh, marketing. Also seen some good examples in our work on self-optimizing networks and how we drive customer experience at the network level. And that started to kind of set a reputation that AI can be valuable uh, in the core of our business. So uh, have you got some, you know, what, what could you share about really good examples of where businesses are seeing real successful applications of innovative AI? I think, I mean, there, there are uh, a myriad of examples. I think some of them start off as, as a small experiments that are then scaled. But um, uh, some of the things that, that at Sainsbury's they've talked about, we've talked about publicly. Um, in, in the Sainsbury's world, the, the, the business talked about farm to fork. So working, you know, from literally the point where a, uh, a cow was conceived, uh, or calf was conceived, through to the point where you're pricing stuff and putting it on somebody's uh, somebody's plate. Um, working, you know, with farmers to work out how you breed more productive uh, milk cows um, is, a, is is an example, and that sort of uh, activity is is massively beneficial to a business like Sainsbury's, but also massively beneficial to the farmer, so the you know, further up, upstream in the, in the value chain, and, and ultimately, uh, you know, better for the consumer because you can start to deliver product. Uh, you know, good quality products at better prices. I learnt at Sainsbury's that uh, the optimum number of uh, worms in a shovel full of soil, and a shovel full is a SI unit, um, is 16. And if you've got 16 worms per shovel full, then the grass is particularly good and that produces fantastic milk. Uh, so these are the things we're starting to measure, right through to, you know, how you price stuff, how you, uh, how you um, uh, optimise your driver delivery schedules. You know, all these things working literally end to end in the business. And then in, in, in other businesses, I mean, you talked a bit about, about O2 and some of the work that I was involved in back then, but um, in the newspaper world, how do you create personalized, personalized newspapers for readers uh, without them losing the opportunity to, dis to discover new stuff? So one of the core tenants uh, of, of a newspaper business is to uh, you know, produce the familiar sport. I always read sport. Uh, to provide the news, but then also to provide discovery. And if you're a, a Times reader or a Sun reader, then that discovery is really important to you. But discovery doesn't mean that you 
uh, can use really simple collaborative filtering to say that you know because you've used uh, always read about sport and cycling and Lance Armstrong and doping that every time there's a doping article that's going to be the thing you're interested in because the uh, the beauty of language is actually as important to some people as the content of the of the articles themselves so we were working with uh, with actually with IBM Watson um, to try and work out how we could codify the language in a newspaper in a corpus of data so you could be delivered a newspaper that was personalized to you based not on your interest but on the style of writing you like, like to read um, which is really exciting kind of game changing stuff Wow, I've learned lots of things about worms today. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> well, talking of worms, um, and no, um, one of the demos we actually have in our little pod um, is uh, probably, I, I guess, one of the, the best in, in, ingrown uses of AI and BT is, is simply around using, I mean, the one advantage of being a large company is you get lots of data. And obviously, it's the data set, the, 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 the significance of the data set that really starts to make uh, AI and machine learning work. Um, so there's an awful lot of data that we can kind of harvest from our network, and I'm sure you guys are doing the same at O2, but um, you know, what can you start to do with that data? And, and one obvious one is spot security threats. Um, so actually the original work that we did, uh, in fact, uh, I don't know if any, any of our research guys, they were lurking in the background, but. Um, but, uh, but uh, some of our research guys, particularly on the run-up to the London Olympics, were saying, well, no, there's probably going to be quite a lot of cyber attacks. One of the problems with, with cyber is often you need to be quite well informed, and, and often the, the information is just on a very large dynamic spreadsheet, so you need to be able to spot patterns in numbers, and we know that we're not very good at that. Um, the machine is so much better. So it initially started around, well, could we use the data to start to spot cyber threats? And then could we then ally that with innovative data visualization tools so that you don't need to be a number cruncher to identify that there's something weird going on in the network? So kind of being inspired by Minority Report and those kind of Tom Cruise things that he was doing, it was really around how do we start to visually represent in real time these attacks as well so that people who aren't number crunchers can just go, oh, hang on, there's something going on there. So from that, we, we developed Saturn. Um, there's also Nexus, which is the next generation. And, and that's really around how do we use that massive data set uh, that our network gives us to start to, to, to get the AI to really work for us so that we can then spot cyber threats as they are happening. Um, and I think that's a brilliant example of sort of going from a research uh, project right the way through to something that we use to help defend the London Olympics and the, I, I can't remember how many million attacks we had per minute, but it was astounding uh, what hackers were doing and it helped us to actually start to, to make sure that that was run so safely. Okay, really interesting. And I think what one of the questions when you listen to some of those real life stories about how AI and, and innovation in AI is applying is, how does an actual organization start? So if, if 43% of large organizations haven't even got a plan. Um, what's your advice to their CDO, their CTO, their CIO about what do they do first? You know, do they deep dive into neural networks and start modeling everything or, you know, or, or do they start with simple pattern matching and start to look for business applications? So, you know, what, where do we start? So I think you start with the business and you start with what the business is trying to achieve. Uh, I, I can't emphasize it enough. The, the, the CFO, the CEO is not interested in whether it's a, a random forest algorithm or a neural net. They're interested in whether it makes money for them, uh, money for the business and improves the customer experience. It's as simple as that. So if you start by defining the applications first um, and then work out the tooling that you need for that. And tooling is you know, the data, the people, the technology. Um, and in order to, to achieve uh, you know, building the right set of technology data and, uh, and, 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 and skills, people skills. You need to become, as I say, best friends with the CIO, the CTO. You need to be uh, uh, you know, co-owner of the business outcomes. Um, uh, <clears throat> and you need to hire the right people. So that means you need to become an employer brand of choice for the applications you're trying to de develop. And, and recognize that you won't be able to, uh, you know, cover all the applications you have in an organization. Uh, with the same set of skills, so you'll need to hire specialist skills to do specialist jobs. Um, some skills are wholly transferable, some genuinely aren't. So if you've got a, a you know, a, a, a forecasting challenge, if you've got people with good forecasting experience, that's that's fantastic. If you haven't, then don't try and look at forecasting as an area to apply uh, your data and, uh, and, and artificial intelligence. 
I'm kind of yeah, I'm kind of in agreement, but I think you should start with the customer. Uh, those of you who just sat into my session uh, will know that we we do an awful lot of customer research. Plus the fact that um, this technology can be used to analyse all sorts of things that customers are doing. Um, and what issues they're finding and what problems they have and whether products are working or not. So I just talked about things like contact centers. I think contact centers are really fascinating places because they're a conduit for lots and lots of customer data. And the thing is we often don't use that data to figure out what customers are doing and what problems they're having. Um, so that's the first thing is identifying from the customer base, you know, what, what the issues are. Is it a problem with the product? Is there something going on there that's causing churn or dissatisfaction? So try and use analytics tools to, to, to identify what the issues are. Um, we also have something in BT, once we've identified what those issues are, we have something called My Customer Challenge Cup. Uh, so typically, uh, you know, if we've identified a particular customer issue, uh, what we try then and do is build a team, um, uh, preferably one that goes across the business, so not in a silo or a department, to actually bring a, you know, a, a, a real kind of diverse skill set together to look at, well, how do we solve those problems? Um, and it's competitive, um, so it's a competition, but um, the, the key, again, on, back to our discussion around getting high-level support, which I absolutely agree, you need, you need the business case and, and the high-level support, um, is that each of those teams also have to get a champion at, uh, in, at that high level, um, and then they compete and gradually get whittled down, and the finals is usually somewhere exotic, although I don't think, I think it was born this year but uh, I think it, it was can uh, I think uh, last year uh, budget cuts I suppose but but, uh, but it, it, that then you know the top three actually do get significant investment um, so and that can be everything from okay we've got a problem getting parts um, into the remote highlands of Scotland so outages there can last a very long time customers don't like that how do we get parts from a depot that's you know hundreds of miles away quickly up there so you know they, they worked on a drone project um, so we now have a couple of drones that we can fly in the highlands so that if there's an outage in the network but that that was again using the customer data actually using the people within the business and their innovation a, a champion at the very high level uh, and solving a real customer problem. I think you touched on a, on, a, on a really important point there as well and that notion of cross-functional teams. Mm. Um, so we talked about innovation before and the, and the idea of a lab or something similar. Um, you know, if you've got the, the, the business owner, the person that's responsible for the outcome you're trying to drive, you've got the, the guy that's responsible for getting the data, the data scientist that's responsible for building the AI, the DevOps guys, the IT guys in a single room working together with a shared set of objectives, then that notion of going from innovation to, to scale becomes a whole heap easier. I mean, I, I could count on, if I took my shoes and socks off, uh, I could count high enough to get to the, the, the number of times where you know, we've not done that and we've gone away and in a small dark room developed stuff uh, and then tried to get it into live in an, in an organization and it's taken forever. You know, we had, a, we had a, a, an AI that took two weeks to develop, would have delivered 10 million pounds of EBITDA to the organization and two years later, we hadn't got it live because we hadn't built the cross-functional team, the mixed team, to, 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 to make sure everybody's on the same journey. Mm, that's really good. I think certainly large organizations, you've got to do that because otherwise you, you just get stuck in glue yeah. and, and you can't get to the end. So although, I mean, I hear what you're saying about it's got to be driven from the business and it's got to be driven from uh, the customer in that particular industry, but I'm quite interested in, and this is more in general, in general for large organizations, do you see AI being more successful in cost reduction, uh, optimization of operations, or more beneficial in revenue generation, customer experience? Uh, where, where would you go first, based on your experience and what you see around there in the world? Oh, well, it can be all of the above. It's just, uh, again, you know, wh what do you want it to do? Um, and well, obviously, I'm biased towards customer experience because that's what I do. So, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an area where I think it can significantly improve customer experience. Uh, we have stats, 73% of customers are thinking things like chatbots could improve the customer experience because hopefully it will get them to their solution without having to, to faff around ringing contact centers. So that's a genuine uh, advantage from a customer experience perspective that probably has a cost knock-on effect as well. Um, but again, you know, I think it can do lots and lots of things. Um, I, I, I think you're right. I think, you know, every area of the business, I, I think where I've historically started is looking at where the big cost lines in the, in, in, in the business sit from a, a cost management perspective. You know, every, everybody assumes their business has some degree of optimization in it, 
you'd be surprised how many processes and things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis in an organization are really suboptimal, and so going after some of those is, is important. But I think you know, typically those things tend to be the big strategic projects that take more than a couple of weeks, and you get wrapped up in all sorts of you know, uh, politics and challenges around getting data and so on. So I think you have to balance off the two things. The first is uh, going after the things that are going to give you quick wins and runs on the board to prove that the team can do stuff that is going to make a difference. Uh, whilst having an eye on the on the longer term plays, and I think uh, one of the things that uh, that a, 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 another chief data officer said to me a couple of weeks ago was uh, they distill it down into uh, those things in an organisation that are digitally native are the best place to start to get some early runs on the board. Why is that? Well, because typically the people that are running websites or doing stuff in in apps understand data, understand how data and, and AI can impact their part of the business, whereas uh, in the typical kind of clicks and uh, the bricks and mortar world. Uh, it's a lot harder. So if you can if you can start there, get some runs on the board there, and then move on to some of the the kind of bigger, more strategic challenges. Okay, good. So so let's change it a little bit. Nicola, you talked about um, data privacy and regulation, and and obviously if you're in a large enterprise organisation, you've <coughs> just spent your at least if you're a CIO in a large organisation, you just spent your life on GDPR for the last. Uh, 12 months and getting ready for, for, for May. Do, do you think the increasing regulation around data will, will deter enterprises from deploying AI and, and data-driven automation? And, and if so, what's your advice? How, how do you get the board on side and over that kind of fear? Yeah, GB, GDPR, to be honest, I've loved the past 18 months talking about GDPR because I think it, it, it brings into sort of crystalline um, sort of uh, definition as to what data do you need about customers and how do you then get them to consent that you will use that data. Um, I know there are some genuine concerns talking to some of our research guys. Um, obviously, you know, we need data for AI to work. Um, and if you're then restricting that data set or, you know, customers are refusing consent and it could introduce bias into that data because if only a certain type of customer agrees for the, for the data being used, it could be a problem for things like fraud detection, for example. If I'm committing fraud, am I going to want to share my data? Probably not. Um, so, I mean, there are all sorts of discussions around, well, does this make uh, Europe um, maybe lag behind in AI? Because we do have restrictions in terms of uh, the, the data, obviously the customer consent piece. I think from a from my, my perspective, it's how do we then sell that back to the customer? So I, I described earlier what I, I call a me economy. Um, so I'm willing to trade my data if I get something back. And I think, again, it's sort of crystallized people's thinking as to, well, what data do I need? And then what's the advantage, not just for me to have that data, but what am I genuinely going to do for the customer if they share that data? So that could be you know, freebies. It could be better service. It could be making things easier. It could be personalization. It could be proactivity. Um, all of those things, I think, are they're things that customers often want. Um, and I think our job, if we want the machine learning and AI to work is to sell it well to the customer that this will give them genuine advantage. I think it's particularly in, in like healthcare is one of the big ones. Um, so if we could, we all shared our health data, um, we could do probably do some absolutely phenomenal things with healthcare. But it's invasive data, and it's you know we're afraid about its data privacy implications of sharing it. And you know it would it would if if people could identify that I've had this problem, will it impact my insurance um, you know, premiums because do they share this data? So there's all sorts of concerns I think around you know my my data um, that have kind of uh, been crystallised by by the GDPR discussion, but could potentially hold us back. Mm. Yeah, I think I mean the the, the brand and reputational risk in getting it wrong is significant, especially when you've got a household brand, whether that's a BT, a Sainsbury's, a Tesco's, a, an O2, whoever else. Um, but I think there's a lens on, on all of this, and that is that uh, GDPR is, has kind of heightened people's perception uh, that, uh, that, that this could be an issue. Um, but lots of organizations have been taking it seriously for a long period of time and recognize that you know, they sit on uh, data which uh, ultimately they could use in the wrong way that would you know, significantly damage their brand, whether that's O2 understanding what people are looking at on the web, whether that's you know, a, a grocery retailer knowing that somebody smokes but also has financial services and health products. Um, you know, the list goes on. Um, but most organizations, most big organizations where uh, you know, the worry about brand and, 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 and reputation have put in place checks and balances to make sure that uh, data isn't used inappropriately. Um, so whether that's a, some sort of information council that says, you know, let's check how 
this data is being used in a, in a live situation. The challenge there, of course, is that you need root and branch, every data analyst, every data scientist, everybody using this data to understand what you can and can't do. Um, and uh, it's very easy to put data into a, into a black box or into a model, uh, and those data get lost in, in the AI that comes out the back end. Uh, and to, to um, Nicholas' point, you know, having uh, have a have a, uh, an algorithm that is doing something untoward to customers because of data that was, you know, accidentally put in or put in without really really knowing. And and the challenge then, and coming back to what Nicholas was talking about before, the human in the loop, uh, how do you unpick this stuff so you can make it explainable, not just to the business but also to customers? So I've just had my bank account closed down or locked out because an AI has done something. You phone customer service, why has it happened? And if you can't explain it, then data is being used not for the good of the customer, but against the customer. Okay, good. So uh, I'm going to just shift it into the telco industry. We, we all, well, Nicola and I still work in it. Annie, you've worked in the telco industry in the past. I kind of have a, a view that, that if the telco industry can get to grips with this and innovate, actually, we could play a really strong role in. Uh, managing customers data building trust around it and giving customers control over that data because it revolves around their mobile phone it revolves around their communication experience and how they interact with businesses is often through the network so um, if you look to the future and you think about that what what can you imagine the role and the opportunity of ai for for a telecommunication service provider in the future what role are they going to play and how can ai help them do that Wow, gosh. <laughs> so I'm taking you back to your uh, <laughs> cosmology or futurology. Futurology. futurology <laughs> that's, the, that's theology. Yeah. That's the right that's one. That's theology. Um, Not urology. I know that, yeah. No, and, and also my crystal ball is broken. Yeah. So sadly, uh, uh, I always say, uh, whatever I say may not be right. Um, but um, I mean, I think that probably more on the pragmatic level, it's around customers just want to be connected and just want a network and the frustration is around if that go, goes wrong or you're halfway through Champions League football and the quality dips and so I think uh, a lot of the stuff again I'm not the person that's qualified to talk about this but uh, some of our research guys are certainly looking at um, can we make sure that you know we, we can optimize the quality of that connection for every customer uh, by effectively using AI to monitor that and, and, and it's changing between fixed line and mobile as well without dropping um, so all of that kind of intelligence we can start to put in the network we, we all have well, we both have very big networks so there's an awful lot that we can actually get from the network um, that's valuable for, for machine learning and AI so you know there's there's a lot that we could do but I think from that customer experience experience perspective it's around sort of optimizing that to make sure it, it never goes wrong ideally <laughs> and I, I, I think there's probably a, uh, a slightly different um, or stand back uh, way of looking at uh, answering that question. I think, you know, whether you're a mobile phone uh, company or a fixed line business or a grocery retailer or a bank or whatever else, the world is changing and people increasingly will understand the importance of the data they have. And, you know, as, as brands, we are not the owners of data, we're the part time custodians of our customer data, in particular our customer data. And I think there's a, there's a play that has to happen at some point where data is made available to uh, consumers and other businesses in order to help those consumers and, 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 and you know, the British economy and so on. Um, whether that's you know, making data available on location from a mobile phone network or on consumption in terms of calorific intake from a, from a retailer, um, the world of open banking is going to change everything significantly. Uh, I just think there's, a, there's a, you know, a, a, an opportunity in, in open data in its broadest sense for data to have a profound impact, not just on the businesses that are, you know, are looking after those data, but also consumers that are interacting with the data. What do you think, Brendan, as well? So, um, I think it's about trust. Yeah. So, so I think that whether you're a network provider or whether you're a bank or whether you're a social network, fundamentally now it's about getting customers to trust you. And I think that the, the business that wins that game wins quite a lot. So, so if you can get the customer to trust you and how you use their data and then how you might allow them to use their data with other businesses, you become the center of the data economy and you can win that game. So it's all about trust. Not, not least of all in, in, in the financial services world with open banking. You think yeah. about the opportunity there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so 
we're kind of uh, getting close to the end. I have one last sort of question. It's a bit random. Um, so Google Duplex. Um, it's the chatbot of all chatbots. Nicola, it's your world. Um, <laughs> so A, is it real? Because, you know, it, was, it wasn't guys. nice, is it real? <laughs> uh, and B, how, how, I mean, not Duplex itself, but how does that type of AI become part of how mainstream, large-scale enterprises interact with their customers uh, in the next five to ten years, and will it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, having just done some um, research on voice assistants especially, it, it's quite obvious that, you know, things like hairdressing appointments, you know, basic stuff like that could well go through your voice assistant. I think uh, a lot of the, uh, the contentious stuff about the duplex one was it wasn't, it didn't say it was a machine. Um, so is that ethical? Um, and I think that uh, Google, if you, any of you are out there, just nod. Uh, I think you've changed that to actually make it um, that it is definitely a machine now. Um, but I think um, it, it's quite an interesting one because we, we did uh, a, a little bit of a proof of concept with one of our logistics customers around an Alexa uh, skill um, uh, around parcel delivery. So it, uh, you could ask Alexa, where's my parcel? Um, and uh, unfortunately, if the data wasn't there, uh, what would then happen? And it's interesting, the scenarios that we ran through was, well, if you start on voice, you're probably going to finish on voice. So you would probably then make a voice call. Now, whether you know that your Google Home or your Alexa would make that voice call for you and maybe initiate the conversation and you then pick it up, or simply it becomes a call into a contact center. Uh, that, that's a viable scenario. So actually our hard hypothesis out of that was, it could generate more calls into the contact center. And then our security guys got into the discussion for some reason, and, and it went really dark, as usual, with security guys and saying, well, actually, this could be used for evil means. And you, if, if you had a beef against a company, you could get all your Google Home and, and Alexas to, to dial the same number and blitz the contact center. So it's effectively a kind of assistant DDoS attack through the phone. Um, obviously, security guys, that's the way their brains work, but um, that's, what, that's a viable hypothesis as well. So I think there's some quite interesting stuff around our uh, relationship with those voice assistants and what the, what the strategy, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of that customer experience strategy out the back? Because actually, no one's planning for more voice calls into their contact center, I suspect. So uh, yeah, that could be one consequence. Andy, any thoughts? I think Nicola's covered it well. Okay. I mean, she's more, more, more bound in the reality of the world than I. Okay, so um, thank you. I'm just going to sum up a little bit. So we're talking about, so how do we innovate in AI in large organisations? And the statistics say that today large organisations do not innovate in AI to a large extent. So how do you get over those barriers? I think both from Andy and Nicola we heard about getting the business on side, focusing on a business problem, leading with the customer, getting sponsorship, Maybe starting innovation at the edge through some sort of innovation lab. Don't try and attack the core straight away. Um, and I think definitely the big, the big message I've taken away, and we see that you know, in my own business, is if you haven't got business ownership of what you're trying to do, you will fail. It doesn't matter how good your technology is. It doesn't matter how good your skills are. You will actually fail to make the business impact that you need to make. So Andy, Nicola, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.